Welcome, everybody. It's so wonderful to see the crowd here tonight. Um, this is our Bernathan College Distinguished Speakers Program. And so welcome to the people in the room. Welcome to the people online. Um, my name is Kristen King. I'm a professor of English here. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Anders Gyllenhaal. Anders is the senior editor at the McClatchy Company, and this is the third largest newspaper company and 11th largest online news network in the country. While vice president at McClatchy, Anders oversaw editorial operations for 30 newsrooms and, uh, and 1,500 journalists across the country. Before taking the vice president role, Anders worked in a number of newsrooms from the Miami Herald to the Minneapolis Star Tribune to the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina. For 20 years, he has been involved in news coverage from the bottom to the top, from reporting on the ground to deciding what gets covered and what goes to press. So I believe he knows his way around. Over the course of his career, Anders has become increasingly interested in the First Amendment and how we will adapt our freedoms to this new environment where things move at warp speed. As an editor of various newspapers, he has been immersed in freedom of information issues, access to public information, and getting at the deeper story through the standards of openness that are set forth in the First Amendment. His passion for these issues drew Anders to industry efforts related to the First Amendment, including a position as chair of the Freedom of Information Committee of the American Society of News Editors. This prominent leadership group battles to open the government and basic information. Anders' years on the Pulitzer board also dealt with these two freedoms, and these are the freedoms that are so core to a healthy democracy, the right to speak and the right to know. In the past few years, Anders has written about technology and its impact on society, exploring such things as the health of the First Amendment and our willingness to safeguard it, uh, even in those awkward times when we need to extend it to people who disagree with us. Just last December, Anders wrote a piece exploring how technology has changed the production, distribution, and consumption of news. With all the manipulation and mangling of information in our digital age, how do we know what is reliable? How can editors and publishers and tech companies work together to help us readers determine if we can trust what we're reading? As you might gather, Anderson ha Anders has had a fast-paced and fruitful professional life. So you may be surprised to hear that he also has a private life. Anders lives in D.C. with his wife, Beverly Gyllenhaal, where they enjoy the vibrant art and culture of the Capitol. Beverly, now retired, was a syndicated columnist and cookbook author. She and Anders have two grown children who live in Nashville, where they pursue careers in videography, technology, and music. And Anders himself is an amateur musician, dating back to his time growing up right here in Bernathan. Who, who would have thought that there would be musical talent in Bernathan? <laughs> he eventually found his way to the banjo and bluegrass music, playing in various bands over time, but most joyfully playing with his children for church. The title of Andrew's talk this evening is, Will the First Amendment Survive the Information Age? There will be time for question and answer, and now I'd ask you to help me welcome Anders Gyllenhaal. Thank you. Actually, questions are required, so think about that as we talk through this. Thank you, Kristen. That's a very wonderful and very thorough uh, um, introduction. Very nice. And um, thank you all for coming out. I know there's a lot of competition tonight. I'm heard uh, hearing around town, so this is delightful that, that you're here. And I want to I want to thank. 
uh, Martha, before we get started, who, is, is, you know, who takes us in every time we come. We get to stay at the Gyllenhaal bed and breakfast up, up the street. And, and, I, and I wanted to also introduce Beverly Mills Gyllenhaal, make her stand up here. Uh, we go everywhere uh, together. It's a, a real privilege and an honor to, um, to be talking about what I, I think is one of the compelling issues uh, of the times, you know, so important for the future of our country. And that, of course, is how do we stay faithful to the First Amendment in a time of so much change? And, um, you know, what are the questions, many questions, that, that go along with that? So let me start, though, with, with a story, one that goes back to the colonial days of this country when we were just beginning to think about the issues of freedom and, and rights, a time when there really was no freedom of speech, no clear freedom of the press. And really, despite what we say about the formation of this country, there was a very limited freedom of religion. You could be thrown in jail for being a Catholic or a Baptist. Or if somebody in government didn't like what you wrote, even if it were true. And that's what happened to John Peter Zenger. There's an illustration. I think it's kind of a kind one. I'm not sure what he really looked like. Um, uh, in 1734, and it's a name that you may remember uh, from your history classes, and he was a printer in New York uh, and uh, operated one of the earliest newspapers in the colonies, the, the, uh, the journal um, here. It was a, um, an aggressive uh, paper that began to criticize uh, our, at the time, pompous and corrupt governor, William Cosby, whose attorney general had Zenger arrested and thrown into jail for seditious libel. And if the jury had followed the laws uh, of the time, which they were you know, fully expected to do, that would have been the end of his career and probably his freedom for, for some years. We were under British law at the time, and it actually held that the, the more true an article was, the more dangerous it was, because the more people were likely to believe it. Think, think about that for, for just a minute. This was, this was the rule. But at this point is where our country began to separate itself from, from the rest of the world. Here's the, uh, a version of the, the trial itself. And, and think about uh, where to go. The jury listened to the case. They pondered the decision. And they went and found, as you may remember, they found Zenger not guilty because what he printed was demonstrated to be true. It would be another 50 years or so before the Constitution was hammered out, you know, just down the road from here, and the First Amendment was tacked on kind of after the fact, partly as a way, maybe primarily as a way to calm fears and, and get the states to, to ratify what, you, you know, has turned into be a profound and hugely powerful set of ideas, probably none more than the, the amendment at the top of the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment, we're all familiar with it. Can we recite it? No, it, you know, we know parts of it by heart. It is 45 words. It is uh, spare and lean, um, unequivocal in, in many ways. And it separates the United States from the rest of the globe, as we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, and the rest of the world remains without freedom of speech to this day, freedom of religion, and freedom of press in fully two-thirds of the geographic area and 80% of the world's population. So it, it's tempting to think of the First Amendment uh, you know, as kind of one of our monuments uh, in Washington or, or, or Philadelphia, you know, kind of carved in stone, um, immovable and solid, a little romantic, sort of not unlike these Norman Rockwell drawings that you'll remember published during the Second World War as part of an appeal for war bonds. They are iconic and stirring, and they put uh, freedom of speech and religion and the press on, on a pedestal. 
But the fact is, and this is my point, that the freedoms of speech and religion and press and the rights that they provide are facing their most profound tests in our history. And the technology and globalization and the, 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 the sheer speed of information itself is rearranging the landscape in ways that, that are testing how we stay faithful and in some cases how we adjust you know, the laws and principles on which this country is based. I do think that the First Amendment will survive the information age, but only if, if Americans recognize how fragile this time is and, and take care to, to protect and support these concepts. You know, will we stand by those absolutism, absolutisms? Congress shall make no law. Uh, or will we back away uh, from, from some of those in, in time? One of the leading First Amendment scholars of, of our time, uh, Columbia law professor Tim Wu, just finished a piece proposing that the First Amendment had become obsolete. Um, you know, w will the interpretations need to change in, in a world that's very different from the ones that uh, these ideas were born into? And here are some of the things that, that are at work. You're all familiar with Charlottesville. Here are the right-wing protesters, and you know what was happening with the speech there. And here are the left-wing protesters uh, all mixed up, and you know what happened there. Net neutrality supporters, uh, a tremendous hue and cry arising over the question of how the Internet is, is governed. Um, debates over religion uh, are, are coming up in all kinds of ways, and sometimes real extremisms. This is the Westboro Baptist Church, which we'll you know, talk about in, in, in just a minute. So this is a sprawling topic. Uh, and, and to try to find our way, I'd like to, to pose seven uh, questions that I think are most significant, along with a few questions that I hope uh, I'll throw in here and there, and I hope some that, that you'll um, put on top as well when we get to the conversation uh, part. But first, a couple of thoughts on on my own experience and, and work, looking back on it now, and looking at this room where I, I took classes not too, too long ago, although we have a kind of a reunion of the class of 70 here. Raise your hand just so we know who, who you are, the young folks. No, that's right. Yeah. Appreciate your coming out. A lot of us uh, in school here. Um, I like to think that that upbringing was kind of a, a, a great preparation for uh, being a journalist. Um, school was tough and demanding, a lot of classics, a lot of reading. Um, uh, we lived in a big old rambling house on the edge of town uh, up on Huntington Pike, six kids of Hugh and Jenny Gyllenhaal, and they themselves were demanding, and but also asking us to be as independent and free-thinking as possible. So we lived on the edge of town, but we also were really encouraged to, to take in the rest of the world where, where the, a lot of change was happening. At, at that time. So I was drawn to journalism. I started to contribute to The Breeze and uh, occasionally the Bernathan Post through high school. And then when I was at college, partly of the year that I was here, decided, yeah, that journalism feels like the right way to go for me. And over four decades as first a reporter for a long time and then an editor in Virginia, New Jersey, uh, uh, Florida, North Carolina, Minnesota, and, and Washington, as Kristen said, I, I came to have just first a fascination for the First Amendment and the foundation that it built. And gradually, uh, maybe you could call it an obsession because of, of the changes that we began to see. Uh, so I started to, to really study this, read everything I could um, about it, uh, and begin to do some, some writing and, and, and now teaching. And it's really a, a fascinating history that you're kind of familiar with, but if you bear with me, I, I think although the, the, the First Amendment was ratified 227 years ago, some interesting facts, it took almost half that time for our country to figure out what exactly does that mean. Um, the First Amendment wasn't applied during the first century of, of that time, a time when a lot of those same colonial laws uh, limiting speech and religion remained in place. Uh, you'll remember that our second president, John Adams, the first thing he did was pass the Alien and Sedition Act, 
and started to throw his critics into jail, not much different than the Zenger case. Only when we lived through you know, wars and, and, and civil rights and, and the friction of the 20th century did the courts begin to give teeth to the First Amendment until, over time, often from those court cases, the, you know, the First Amendment became the strongest by far in, in, in the world, the widest publishing routines that are available. And interestingly, on those courts, at a time when in our country, you know, we can disagree about almost everything, uh, on almost all of the First Amendment topics, conservative and liberals, on the appellate and the Supreme Court, and particularly in recent years, have seen the First Amendment in the same way. It may be one of the few places where there is that agreement. Until, starting about 10 years ago, we began to undergo you know, all of these changes in technology and, and information and the collision of ideas in a, in a country that is, is struggling with this division. Um, taken together, we have discovered, I, I think, that we, we are not so sure about the, the bedrock concepts behind the First Amendment. So let me move to the first question. which has to do with how technology is affecting us. You know, is the internet reshaping things? So much of this is being litigated. It's sort of hard to say, and the applications are moving so fast. But there are a myriad of questions that come out of this. And let me just throw a couple at you. And if you know the answer to this, do I have to be close to this to make this work? I guess I do. There we go. Should a Facebook like be protected by the First Amendment? And by protected, I mean, can you say, you, know, you can't sue me or you can't take my job because I like something on Facebook? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so in other words, are you covered if you click like on, on, on a Facebook post uh, protected from it, and the answer. Hired by, could they not say, yeah, you can't do that? Yeah, and that was exactly the question that came up in the courts, and the ruling on that was, you are protected, and the, and the important part of this was that the judges first said, well, this is too small of a thing, but then we began to realize that we're all living in in, in this way, so. Eventually, and this hasn't been tested fully, but when it comes to Facebook likes, it is protected. It is considered a part of speech. Is video game a form of speech? And think of some of these things that you may watch or your, your kids, uh, how vicious and, and, and wild they can be. Is this protected by the First Amendment? That you can put you know, almost anything short of causing, uh, uh, projecting violence into them. And the answer there, again, is yes. Do you have the right to follow uh, a president, for instance, or uh, another politician on Twitter. Uh, the president has thrown people off Twitter uh, for various reasons. And do you have a constitutional right, a First Amendment right, to, to, be, uh, to be a follower? Yeah. <laughs> and the answer right now is we don't know. It's being tested in the courts. Good answer. And it's being tested in the courts. Uh, there's a lawsuit over it saying, well, this is one of our leaders, so it's, in effect, important information. And just like the, the, the right to, to, to get access to information, you should have the right to that. Uh, so a lot of these things are still being worked on and haven't gotten it. Is an algorithm, a database, a search, a collection of searches, is that protected? It, can Google say, well, even if these searches are faulty in some way, you can't sue me uh, because it, it is a First Amendment right. The answer here is yes. Right. That's not the right answer this time. It is. It is protected. And, and so this gives you a sense of how we're wrestling with the questions of how far does the First Amendment go? Um, is fake news protected by the First Amendment? That's kind of a joke. We'll just move on from that. <laughs> If Siri says something that you don't like that offends you, can you sue her? 
Has that happened? Uh, not that Siri. Uh, if Alexis says something that, that you object to, can you sue somebody? And I'll admit to, to you that uh, originally I put this in as a joke, but now there's a lawsuit over uh, saying Alexis's sort of o overall thoughts that you now, many of us, are hearing on a regular basis is protected by the First Amendment. Um, so uh, I think I have one more. What about a story written by a computer, which is more and more common? Uh, an opinion piece written by a computer. You can encounter them. Hopefully you know it. Is this protected by the First Amendment? Yes. Sure. I, I think all of the objectives are incorrect because it's the, the, uh, the First Amendment talks about uh, uh, private citizens' relationship to government, not to private, uh, private parties and private businesses. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, the First Amendment has nothing to say about the interpersonal and person to business relationship. Yeah. And that's a, a perfectly reasonable position to take. But the interesting thing here is that the, the courts are wrestling with what are very difficult questions and finding, in this case, in many times, that the First Amendment, and you know, you're, you're correct in that the First Amendment is about Congress shall make no law, but the extension and the case law that flows from that goes much further than just the government. So what we're seeing is wrestling with all kinds of new areas, um, the impact of of technology and the internet is that speech and expression and, and even religion are made so much more powerful. You know, they're, they're spread so much more quickly among people. And that means that opinions are colliding, you know, in, in so many vitriolic ways. You know, the phenomenon of, of trolls on the internet who attack one another uh, and us for sport, shutting down, uh, you know, opponents by the sheer volume uh, of some of those attacks. Have, have taken over, making it very difficult. Uh, the same professor that mentioned earlier, Professor Wu, said that speech, which is supposed to be the lifeblood of democracy, has become weaponized in a way. So these are a, a set of really tough topics. And we're going to come back to, Pete, some of the things that, that you, you said. Uh, but to move through the seven questions, are we losing our commitment to free speech? Now, particularly in the last year, uh, you know, we have seen turmoil on, on, on so many fronts. Uh, Berkeley, uh, which, you know, is the birthplace of the free speech movement of the 60s, had to cancel speeches or cancel speeches by several firebrand conservatives, Ann Coulter and Milo Yiannopoulos, amid, uh, you know, protests and, and near riots by, by students who said, they couldn't stand to hear what these people would say. And this, of course, is full of ironies, because by doing that, you drew a whole lot more attention to what they, they were saying. At the same time, a lot of these speeches seem to be engineered for that same very impact. Yes? Are you aware of the President's Harvard Law Center that says, we're not going to tell you you can't do speech, but if you do certain things that you're seeing your individual resources, so you will speak to a very small number of people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it's been interesting to watch all of our institutions try to grapple with this, and particularly colleges. It's important to, to talk, about, talk about it here. I, I don't know if you've had issues along these lines, uh, but the, the schools are, are slowly catching up to this. Uh, but we're seeing a real change of attitude on, on the part of particularly younger people and certainly minorities and both extremes in, in politics. And we've reached a point, you know, think about it, where we really don't listen to one another. And many times those uh, extremists among us try to block uh, the, the speech uh, that they don't agree with. Here is a protest uh, at one of the uh, Trump rallies early on uh, in, in the campaign. And here is a sign I love. I, I don't know whether this is a joke or not, but I thought it was interesting and, and kind of represents, I don't mean to make fun of, of, of this, but it is you know, part of, of the issue of how are we going to um, deal with this. And it's coming from both sides politically. Both sides are trying to stop the others uh, from speaking. So a related question, this allows me to throw in more questions at seven. I turn it to yellow, so that means it's not really one of the seven questions. But 
do, should hate speech be permitted uh, under the Constitution? And nowhere is this more tested, the, uh, the principles. Uh, you know, sadly, you can encounter this you know, every day on the Internet. And in cases like what we saw in Charlottesville. And the, the courts have always held that, you know, that the extreme of hate speech is the price that we pay for a robust, you know, for all kinds of speech. And it can be as extreme as the Westboro Baptist Church practice, where, if you remember, they, they protest the funerals of soldiers killed in combat as a way to, to campaign against gay rights. And, you know, the result of that is they get a lot of attention for it. Um, so it's, it, you know, it can get really heinous. And the, the Charlottesville protests last year, I think they pushed the speech issues into a new realm. Uh, the ACLU stood up for the rights of white supremacists to, to march, and that, of course, led to deadly uh, clashes. Um, and it's interesting to compare that case with uh, uh, the most famous sort of similar case in the past, the uh, when the Nazi sympathizers wanted to march in Skokie, uh, Illinois, it's, it's just largely a, a Jewish community in 1978, the Supreme Court held at that time that they had a right to march. And there was you know, tremendous clamor over it, not unlike Charlottesville. But in the end, it all petered out because of the stand that the court took. And, and I think you know, that was a, a happier ending than, than what we're seeing now. Um, you know, as, as a country that's dedicated to free speech, we struggle perhaps most when we put politics uh, into the mix, shifting gears a little bit. And two of the most interesting cases have uh, to do with very different questions. One is the Citizen United uh, case in which the Supreme Court ruled that money is a form of speech, and this allowed the flow of uh, anonymous funds into politics, which, you know, continues to be under dispute although it looks like uh, settled law, but there's a lot wrapped up in this. Is, is, is it right for this to be anonymous? How do we handle the overflow of speech? It's pretty interesting that a lot of predictions were made about the results of, of this ruling prior to two, 2016. In the end, both sides in the campaign got about the same amount of money from these kind of nonprofits and uh, 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 you know, units that were, that were funding like that. So, is something we're going to have to watch. Um, another case pending before the Supreme Court now that everyone's familiar with involves the, um, the baker in Colorado who argues that, that the First Amendment should allow him to refuse to make a, a wedding cake for a gay couple because it violates his freedom of expression and religious beliefs. This, this court case will likely be decided in the spring, and it is full of really, really difficult and interesting questions. Um, the likes of which, you know, few other countries take on in the way that we do in such an open and, and vibrant debates. The one, the one point that, that I would make is that I do wish more often that we reached our c conclusions, our own personal beliefs about cases like these, not based on the politics that we hold, which so often seems to be the case, but if we start with the, the fundamental questions and let that be what decides. I love hearing people whose politics is one thing, but when they look at cases like these, they come up on the opposite end, which I think is probably a more a genuine way, way of approaching it. So the third question is, um, has to do with the powerful companies that now you know, dominate uh, our world in the space of just 10 years. Uh, the, the, the landscape has been changed by, you know, so many companies, the top five, though, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft, are worth $2.5 trillion up or down, depending on the day, which is more than the GDP of most countries. And now they control most aspects of, of communication, distribution, devices that we have on us uh, right now, storage and creation. Um, but they are unlike their media predecessors, the networks, the, the, the big newspapers of the past, because they have shown almost no interest in the principles of the First Amendment. The, their issues have been um, privacy and government intervention, such as the Apple case when they uh, uh, ran into uh, a very serious dilemma over the, the phone uh, owned by the San Bernardino terrorists. 
Uh, but that was a case of their, their private interests. Um, a couple of months ago in, in Washington, I had a chance to ask one of the, the Facebook's journalistic leaders, where do you stand on the big questions of the First Amendment? Do you think you should have a stronger stand as the most powerful media and, and news provider in the country and perhaps the world? Where do you stand? And I got a really interesting question, I thought, and, and I was surprised by it. He said, well, we just haven't thought about it. Um, I, I think uh, that this is important, you know, because the, the development and shaping of the First Amendment occurs because we have powerful champions uh, in, in law, in, in the media, in, in politics working on it. It doesn't happen by itself. You have to pursue cases, sometimes spend millions of dollars to, 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 to determine, well, where do we stand? And most of those in the past, I feel like we're being pushed for the public's interest to keep the government honest and open. And what happens if, if that disappears in the power shifts uh, th that are going on? Um, oh, and I forgot, here's the, the, the Facebook talker. You all know what he looks like, so we'll move along. Um, the fourth question is, uh, what do we make of the increasingly commercial use of the First Amendment? For most of the history uh, of, of the Bill of Rights, speech uh, having to do with business and, and uh, commerce, you know, what you might say about your company, the advertising claims you might make that your teeth will get whiter or, you know, whatever, had no protection. The court had, didn't see commercial speech as deserving of the same standards as, as civil speech, and particularly political speech, which is ranks the highest. But that changed in the 70s as companies began to realize, well, we can get some benefit if we push First Amendment rights, get to say more in our advertising, uh, get to protect them. And it began with first tobacco companies and pharmacies and Apple and others. Today, more than half of the rulings coming from the Supreme Court have to do with business and commercial interests. Now, some of this is, is, is natural and, and comes with an increasing appropriate focus on business and the economy. Uh, and, and in a way, is, I think these kind of cases have, are good for the First Amendment because they force us to think about some of the difficult questions. You know, how do you preserve rights? Where does speech, how far does it go? But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're, uh, what happens when the First Amendment is used to support private interests rather than public ones, uh, they do take away from the original purpose of the First Amendment. The fifth uh, question is, is, how is the media in general going to remain strong at a time really when the business model is, is failing? You know, one of the most obvious results has been a profound shift in fortunes in all media companies. The leading uh, news organizations, whether it's national or local, uh, uh, um, print, print or broadcast, they have lost more than half of their revenues. And I know this because I've been living this life now for the last 10 years. And journalism companies have adapted. They, they have figured out how to adjust. They've learned to economize, how to use technology uh, better. But it's still not clear, even at this point, 10 years into this, you know, what form our news organizations are going to take over time not everyone sees this as a great loss. Uh, the, the press has never been uh, a popular uh, pursuit, and there's plenty of critics you know, around these days. But there's a lot at stake in, in this question. You know, if we don't have a free and independent media, one that's able to strong, stand up to often very, very, very strong powers that be, you can't expect to have a, you know, a thriving democracy. And, and so there's a lot at stake in this one, too. The last two questions uh, have to do with our place in, in the world, you know, a world that is getting smaller and, and leading to conflicts that, that wouldn't have happened you know, even a generation ago. Um, you know, when, when Terry Jones, a pastor in Florida, you will recall, who uh, in 2010 said he was going to burn the Koran, and then a year later actually did burn the Koran, um, more than two dozen people died in protests uh, following that in Afghanistan as that news ricocheted across 
the globe. Um, uh, here is the, 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 the burning and effigy uh, right before the, those deaths. And then there's the attack on Charlie Hebdo, that's a French magazine, that is often you know, ruthless and so disrespectful, uh, but that's satire, and had been doing that for years until the world became so much smaller, and suddenly we have you know, another attack taking the lives of, of a dozen uh, of the, the staff members there, and really leading to the, the decline of that, um, that publication. Here are a couple of those covers. A uh, 100 Lashes If You Don't la Die Laughing is that one. Um, uh, and this is um, the, the, the Muhammad uh, on his knees saying, I'm the prophet. Uh, shut up, you infidel, it says. And then um, here is the, uh, a, a, a rabbi, a, a pope, and a Muslim, a Islam, Muslim leader saying, we must censor Charlie Hebdo. So it's really pushing things to the edge, which is part of what satire is, but it's leading um, in, in a world that's uh, suddenly much closer together. Um, conflicts become profound and, and often deadly, and really in so many ways the West, the East, the Mideast have never understood each other, and the introduction of terrorism and all that can be a, a deadly combination. So you know, our wide open freedom of, of religion and speech and press are in um, you know, contrast to the rest of the world. And here's, here's where uh, I think the questions really loom large. Um, th this is, uh, I, I think, a tough one for us. Uh, there have been uh, times um, when our First Amendment standards and how we tried to project them on the rest of the world were a higher priority, um, where we had ambitious programs to, to support and try to extend those rights and where we confronted human rights struggles around the globe. And our, our focus has shifted at the same time as our own standing and how well we're abiding by our own rights has come under fire. And that makes it harder for us you know, to preach to others. And it allows, I think, critics to find fault with, with our religion. But this is an important question. And it's made more important when you look at these maps. You've probably seen them. But this first one is the, the outline of, of press freedoms around the world. The red, uh, the black, the darker the color, the less freedom. And this is where I said earlier, you know, that 80% of the world and two thirds of the geographic area uh, has none of those freedoms. And it's pretty much the same map, if you can see that, when it comes to religion. Uh, these go hand in hand. The same countries that, that are not allowing rights or of press and, and, and speech are, are looking the same way about religion. This is a, uh, a profound question for, for us to be thinking about and, and, and one that we might want to come back to um, as I sort of uh, wind things up. So I've thrown a lot of material and questions at you. I hope the points are, are, are coming through, that we're at a really delicate time. And, and there are, are a, a lot of, of, of issues that have to be dealt with. We've I think gotten so used to thinking of the First Amendment as that Norman Rockwell kind, kind of portrait. We were the globe golden standard that we, we take it for granted. Um, polls show enormous support for the First Amendment in kind of a general way. But then when we get down to the ground level and think about how to apply it, it starts to fall apart. There was this comedy group that went to Yale University uh, two years ago in the midst of when they were having some speech issues there. And they did a bunch of interviews and they found that more than half of the people they talked to were willing and, and ready to, uh, to, to um, repeal parts of the First Amendment. Um, uh, so let me wind up by giving you uh, my answers to some of these questions, not all of them, uh, but then I'd like to, to, to hear some of yours. On the question of whether we should hold firm on the absolutisms, you won't be surprised to, to hear me say that we have to, that we have to extend pretty much the same freedoms that we've applied in publishing, in religion, in speech to the internet, recognizing that it's going to be tougher, it's going to be messier, but it's the only real way, I think, to, to make this, this work. Um, on the question of do we dial down these freedoms to accommodate you know, sometimes vicious 
an alarming fringe. Uh, it's a tougher choice, and, and it can be really disturbing. But even in a time of, of, of trolls and, and you know overflow of hate, just like the courts have held, if we don't put up with those who, who seem to cross what, whatever our lines might be, we're not going to benefit from the broader picture. So it becomes uh, very important. Plenty of people nowadays are calling for crackdowns on speech that makes them uncomfortable. But just think about where that line might be. Everyone's line is going to be in a different place. So how do we live with that? I think the absolutes are important. I think money is a form of speech. And I think that if we are, we believe we're polluting our political system by having too much of it, we can find other ways uh, of dealing that. I, I think the increasing corporate use of the First Amendment is OK as long as we stick by the spirit of these concepts and don't lose sight of what the framers were thinking when they wrote that, you know, that very thin, unequivocal paragraph, that we recognize the freedoms of expression and religion and speech and press and assembly. That's the whole five. They are you know, the lifeblood of democracy. I think we're, we're making a mistake if we back away from exporting our principles. Um, we have to push them as, as hard as we can. I mean, you can see that the global struggle of the future is very likely going to be between the US and its allies and China. And you know the battle is often framed as competing economies and who is the strongest economically. But we shouldn't forget that the US and China also embrace two diametrically opposed systems when it comes to these freedoms. And it, so it's a really important competition if, if, with, with the rest of the world on the question of which way our country is going to go on these really important points. And let me make one last, last uh, observation. We are, you know, we're in a difficult passage in this, this country. We are divided politically and we really aren't talking. You know, our Congress is stalled for the most part. You know, mistrust in institutions is, is very high. We're losing faith in some ways in our, in our principles. But the answer is not to back away from these fundamental concepts because they're hard to apply. Open expression, government transparency, the ability to say what we think are, in fact, the answers, I think, to those very questions. The story of, of Peter's anger, you know, where we started uh, tonight and where the country itself began you know, its march toward the First Amendment freedoms, offers maybe kind of a path forward. At the time of that trial, there were none of, of the freedoms that we have today. You know, you could be convicted for telling the truth. And they carved out a, a whole new path. And I think many of the answers to these, these seven questions uh, are, are in the history uh, of our country when it comes to the First Amendment. And the sacrifices that have been made and the risks that have been taken to build these principles into our system, I think if we keep that, that in mind, uh, we can find a way to figure all this out. So. Let me stop and, and, and see what's on your mind. We were starting to get some questions there, and then I ramble on. And, and yes, right, please. Uh, isn't hate speech being codified already? For instance, hate speech is now a law or a definition, and so isn't part of free speech already being codified and defined, or am I right. missing well, the point? No, no, yeah, I mean, hate speech has been ruled to be acceptable up to the point where it is prompting violence on someone's part. So the law is pretty clear on that. I think the issue is that we are backing away from that as a country. The courts and the law is in one place, and I think the popular view is in a whole lot of other places. So we're sort of out of step with what our, our jurisprudence is. At the same time as the, the courts have many, many things coming down the road, uh, like those ones that we mentioned, that are going to be tough ones to decide. So I think the question is, how do we get behind and stay faithful to those principles, even recognizing that technology is turning some of them into more difficult ones? Is that, yeah. yeah. How do you see advocating for the First Amendment 
in the way that it has traditionally been, right. uh, you know, exercised. Yeah. I think there are, there are several things um, uh, that I, I would you know, put out there. One is I think these technology companies need to take some responsibility for it. Uh, you know, Google and Facebook in particular have tried not to be defined as media companies. And yet the majority uh, of, of the population gets their news from Facebook. And so they really are media companies. And then, so then the question becomes, where do they stand? They have enormous power. And I think just in a way that, uh, you know, gentle, firm advocacy to keep government open, to keep speech free, to deal with it, was part of the media franchise of the past. It needs to be passed on to the new players. Um, but I also, I also think that um, we don't hear much from our politicians in general uh, on this question, and it would be good if there was a stronger stand on that. Uh, and, and then, of course, the rest of us, where, where do we stand? Now, I don't expect uh, this to, to become a, a, a high priority for most people I, I, until something provokes it. And when that occurs, I think we have to stand for those principles. So there's a couple of different ways that we're not seeing it happen. Uh, on the question of exporting our beliefs, we have to be very careful. I mean, you know, most countries don't want to hear us preach to them. We have to mostly live by being a model. But there are times when we can do more. And, and we have done more in the past, put pressure on allies. Look what's happening in Turkey right now which is a major ally to us and has traditionally been the, the gateway of East, East and West. They have completely uh, uh, taken over. Uh, the press has been subjugated. People have been thrown in, in, in jail. So I, I think you know, it's tough to say, here, Turkey, here's how to run. They're in a pretty difficult geologic, geopolitical position. But we need to stand firm and push for those rights when we're dealing with foreign policy. National security issues. Okay, so this is the time we have here. Uh, it's a huge issue, and it's a it's a tough issue. Uh, think of Edward Snowden. Uh, you can't turn that back. Uh, we'll be better off knowing it uh, than than not. Uh, I think there's a constant pressure between the press and national security. Uh, when you look at the history of the cases where the government has said we've gone too far, it's very difficult to find uh, 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 real negative impacts of that. Um, how many people have saw the, the Post, the movie Post? And uh, certainly a huge, very difficult national security case. Most of the time, the government doesn't want the uh, public to, to, to know the whole story. And part of the reason, part of my message here is the press has to be long enough, strong enough to both be able to tell that story and be responsible about it. So in, in the past, I think you look at most of those cases. Now, the, the Post is a movie that's, that's tailor-made for you to be in favor of what they ended up doing. And of course, I think most of us looking back on the Pentagon Papers would agree with that. So there's many issues there. Um, I think we're finding our way. But it's really important for the media to be strong enough and responsible enough to make those decisions. The, the, um, the Panama Papers came along after the Pentagon Papers, and that was this huge trove of information about a whole underworld uh, 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 money flow that our company was a partner on. We won the Pulitzer Prize for this last year. Uh, huge hue and cry from Russia, where you saw, if you remember the story, uh, a, a lot of money flowing out of the Kremlin. Iceland's president had to step down. Those governments claimed national security, but in fact, all of those stories needed to be told. So it's a it's a constant daily battle. Is that answering your your question? Okay, a little bit longer. Than, yes. Hey. Yeah. To post certain types of articles or to comment and things like that. But what if you have a, a, a predominantly Chinese owned American company right. who can put any amount of money into direct contributions or into uh, uh, speech? 
Yeah. Um, then how does that play out? They right. They influence it very legally. Sure. But right. It's still foreign influence. Yeah. Well, it's it's a a, a question um, that of course is we're still getting to the bottom of what exactly happened in in, in the in the Russia case, but. I think there can be pretty clear laws about go uh, foreign governments uh, and their speech rights using our, u our, our institutions, and those need to be strengthened and, and prevented because we saw whether, you know, to the degree that Russia was, uh, 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 you know, trying to change the outcome of an election, we, we may never know. But just the attempt at that, you know, cannot be permitted. But how can you permit it? Well, you can have laws that say... It, Yeah, I think the law is going to be stronger on, on this, you know, and that, that doesn't necessarily prevent it, but it is a, a part of the response that I think we'll see come out of this this whole episode. Yeah. So uh, you had a post of five and you said, well, that's a joke, so I won't cover it. But um, in, in the idea of fake news, we had an a interesting thing. We're big uh, fans of the Perseid meteor shower. And so a news story comes up saying the biggest e e event in the history of man, I think, or something. It was, I mean, it was, anyway, and we fell for it and we, you know, shared the story. And it turns out it was never, there was no truth in it. I mean, it was, it was going to be a normal year. And they did it just for, for financial gain to try and to get you trolling into their site. So is it protected to say things that you clearly know are not true, even if they're not political. They're just... Yeah. Well, I, I didn't mean to say that fake news isn't an issue. I was trying to move along. But let me, let me put it this way. Um, if, if you publish something that's inaccurate, you're open, to, uh, open yourself up to all kinds of responses, most of them civil, that, uh, that aren't necessarily First Amendment issue related. But you, you can be you know, sued for, for uh, defamation, for... Uh, all, all sorts of things. So there is a remedy for that. The problem is that most of the fake news is being produced by uh, organizations you can't even find, you know, hidden, hidden away in, 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 uh, in what we saw. You know, that's much harder to contend with. So I don't think we're going to control the fake news problem by um, legal remedies. I think what we have to do is provide the kind of information uh, with, with news accounts that help you know whether this is a legitimate organization that's writing about this or not. And there's a lot that's going on on that front. We're working on uh, with a bunch of other uh, companies on a kind of a housekeeping, good housekeeping seal that would run with stories that would tell you who wrote it, what they're like, who, they, who owns it, and it would help you find your way. I think it's mostly up to us to figure out whether this is something we can trust or not, sort of like you know other products. You can, you can go sue if you don't like uh, something you purchased and you know consumed whatever, but it's a lot easier for us to protect ourselves. That's probably where the solution is for this. Yeah. I'm wondering, would you see a, um, a growing problem of kind of uh, like internet mob lynching yeah. that goes on? Um, and I'm wondering what you do about that. Things like uh, the the guy the guy who killed the the lion in Africa. Right. Right. And suddenly people are threatening his family, threatening his home. Right. Just such a, like this mob attacking that, um, just like a, a mob in a street coming right. and battering down your house. And it happens in small ways, just yeah. even like on my personal Facebook friend, um, right. Facebook page with people who are supposedly friends of mine on Facebook. If I say something that's not, I don't consider it inflammatory, but it's standing up for something that's important to me. Right. Um, if that is something that's right. not considered the in thing sure. to write, yeah. there's this dive on. It's not no. There aren't rational arguments. There aren't. It's just yeah. like people diving on until you shut up. Yeah, and, stop and the answer talking. here is that we don't have an answer for this yet. But uh, the, 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 there's a difference between when you're kind of getting taking heat from your friends. You don't have much remedy there, uh, versus you know true trolling where there's a, a, a basically an assault. And we talked earlier about uh, the, the professor's argument that the, the First Amendment is obsolete. He was talking about this very problem, that an overwhelming amount of speech directed uh, as, as a revenge on something 
uh, is very hard to deal with. However, there are laws that could apply and that need to be applied. I mean, it's basically it's stalking. So there are laws that exist on the books now to try to respond to that. I don't have a lot of faith that there's easy remedies for it. It's part of the world that we live in now that, that this is going on. Uh, and so I think you should expect to take heat from your friends along those lines. More, more bothersome is the, is the fact that this is uh, putting some you know, companies, and journalists often get this, we get this a lot, you know, a huge amount of outpouring uh, that can be very difficult to deal with. There's not easy solutions. What came to my mind then was that with speech itself, I'm one person, I have my one uh, you know, quota of free speech. Yeah. But if you take money as free speech, how does it, how does it deal with the question of inequality? So yeah. suddenly someone can have 40,000, in a sense, you know, right. Right. cards of free speech as yeah. opposed to someone who can't. It's a, good, it's a great way to, to ask this question. and. Like a lot of these things, these are not easily ciphered. Uh, there is going to be inequality, and there is inequality now. These days, celebrity is a form of power in speech. You get a lot more attention. We're all competing for a, a, a limited amount of attention. I think if you turn it around and say, if I'm going to say uh, you can't use your money to publish something or to contribute to a politician or, or whatever it is, it's an easier way to look at the negative impact of limits on it. I think it's very difficult, and it's very easy to say we should have limits that there, you know, that, that political campaigns need to be a thousand dollars, you know, whatever it is. It never has worked. It has been a very difficult thing to to, to measure. Whoever's better at getting around that is going to succeed. So I I think you have to look at money. As, it, it, as a form of speech for those reasons. It's more that if you turn around and try to limit it, then you're running into all kinds of problems that are un unusable. I also think that the question of anonymity is really important. Uh, it, it, that the Supreme Court ruling in the United, Citizens United said the solution is to uh, make, make clear who is contributing, the transparency. Uh, uh, but then Congress decided not to pursue that. And it has become, I think, where the battleground is. That, to me, makes a lot more sense. That you know, I, I think there's an argument against acquiring uh, transparency. Think about the colonial days when so much of what, of what was written, including the Federalist Papers, were anonymous. I think there's a, a power in, in being able to speak anonymously. But that's where the, the, the debate, I think, ought to take place on the question of transparency. That e Thank you. As if that equalized things. But when a corporation is a person, you have corporations contributing to both parties against the interest of their competitors or the people who are not corporations. Right, right. Well, the, the, the ruling that a corporation is a person is the most curious part of that decision. And I think it's kind of misunderstood in lots of ways. What they're saying is the corporation has some of the same rights as an individual does. That doesn't solve your problem, which is that you see this, our campaign's awash in money, and so much of it is used for obnoxious advertising, you say. There ought to be a law against that. Uh, but I just think we're working our way through a period, a big question, and it's going to take time for us to figure out what's the right answer. The, the fact that there was equal, uh, uh, roughly equal contributions, I think it only helps in as much as you can say, well, it didn't favor one side dramatically over the other. That's helpful. It's not the solution to the problem. Yeah. Well, first of all, corporations were deemed equal in the late 1800s. So it's not a new thing. Um, but I would like to ask, would you please explain for the people who are not familiar with it what the term troll and trolling means? Sure. Uh, uh, most of us probably have experienced trolls. That's just somebody who uh, anonymously on the internet is sending vicious uh, 
messages and, and often getting together in a campaign to overwhelm, overwhelm somebody. I know a lot of trolls personally. I, they, they, we have relationships with trolls. I, you, get, you get to know them over time in this business. It's really interesting. We've tried so many different things in messages uh, and um, commenting sections uh, of, of our publications where we'll say, um, if you've spent time, anyone spent time comment? Any trolls in that? <laughs> Um, there's a lot of people when we, we sort through it that so many of the worst messages are coming from a very small number of people. So think about you know, your life, you know kind of those types of folks and they have found a very powerful tool in this. And so the issue of trying to crack down on them has a lot of appeal. You know, how do you do it? Who's going to decide who a troll is? And, and, and what that is. So it, it's, it's one of the things that we I think have to live with, but on the on the commenting sections, we would try to register. We, for a while, you had to uh, register on Facebook to post comments. It didn't really improve the situation. It just meant people left that at that area. So, the uh, trolls um, are, are uh, I think, are going to be with us for a while. Uh, maybe there'll come a time when this when this fades. Uh, it's hard to see that that happening um, anytime soon. So you're right; they've been been around for a while. Yes. I know the question that you're answering is, or talking about, is more whether it's going to persist through the age of information and survive through the age of information. But do you think it's applicable as written to our modern age and all of the technology that's there? And with all of the gray areas that you've mentioned tonight, do you think that maybe it should be not abolished, but <clears throat> reconsidered at least, or rephrased, or something along those lines? Yeah. Well, there's two parts to that, and, and the first one is that we are not going to me mess with the Bill of Rights in this country. I think we look at them as uh, sacred, and that's probably the right way to look at it. But there are lots of other things that we, we can be doing and considering that, that try to, to bring remedies to, to some of these problems, some of which I've mentioned, but there's m many others, and I think folks are working on it. We need to rewrite our whole technology oversight in, in Congress. There's, there's a desperate need, and when the Net Neutrality Act uh, was, uh, was reshaped in November, um, the real problem they were trying to address couldn't be handled by, in this case, you know, one uh, agency, FCC, trying to deal through a, a fairly limited amount of, 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 of different kind of laws. It needed to be rewritten in general to keep up with the times. We're not up to that. I mean, Congress isn't doing anything, much less one of the most difficult things you could take up. But yes, I think there are plenty of, of things that can be done. We should be careful. I mean, you need to give uh, you know, a period like this some time to watch it. We don't want to overreact. Because what the First Amendment basically says is we want a free market approach. Congress shall make no law. And from that, many other uh, interpretations were that you know we should have a wide open system. And we're paying a price for that now because wide open these days it can be pretty negative. But I think that's uh, uh, still the, the top principle. That shouldn't be messed with. But we need to respond uh, with other kinds of laws to try to deal with some of this. Yeah. I was just thinking, I've, I've used the phrase in leadership positions, like in the newspaper business, you needed to be paying attention to people and you'd better have pretty callous skin because of all the stuff thrown at you. Yeah. And I'm sort of thinking that maybe in this environment that we live in, we all need to be sensitive with thick skins because people are just going to say stuff yeah. that is deeply offensive to us. Right. And rather than trying to create a world in which we keep them from saying it, we have to figure out a way not to have it get to our heart. You know, and and that's hard. Yeah, no, and that's I, hard. Yeah. Uh, you know that the thing you were joking about is you know we should stop free of speech that hurts people's feelings. Well, yeah. good luck with that one. Right. Uh, particularly if we're talking about the fifth graders at the Bernathan Church School, why we're yeah. in serious trouble. <laughs> I mean, it sounds to me like a sermon in there somewhere. I don't, I don't know. No. But let me say one thing, which is there's a beginning to be thoughts that in addition to the right to speak, to publish, etc there should be a right to listen. And it's, it's just forming in, 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 in law that there might be a right to say, 
I have a right to hear this, which is a, you know, a way to counter. It's, it's hard to see how it, would it apply, but the principle itself is very appealing to me. That these days, our problem isn't that you know, our problem is that we have too much going on. We can't, you know, find our way through it all. We're overwhelmed with this information. You know, how do we make sure we're hearing the most important stuff? And so I, I think that may be a, a one way to approach it. Um, yeah, Pete. Uh, yeah. Just start yelling, and we'll get we'll get. Okay. Yeah. The first thing is what uh, uh, Eric said, um, uh, have a thick skin. But I think the best way to deal with um, uh, Nazi skinheads marching is simply don't show up. Yeah. How would they feel if they're walking down Main Street and, like, nobody's watching? Right. Sure. Uh, how, do you, how do you control that? I mean, that's well, really the, the question. I, I, you, know. you don't. You don't. That's, yeah. All I'm suggesting is that is that, that is an approach and a mindset that I think would be very effective good point. If, if, if people of, of, uh, of good character just didn't show up and give yeah. them an audience, what would they do? And the second, right. yeah, am yeah. I talking too loud? No, no, that's oh. good. What was the other one? Uh, shoot, I forgot it. Um, oh, um, I think that we do ourselves a disservice and overcomplicate things when we we, we talk about something as um, freedom of speech or expression when it's really a property rights issue. The cake baker in, 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 um, in Colorado, I believe, yeah, he was expressing himself when he made particular types of cakes, but the fact of the matter is he was being forced uh, to, he was being forced to use his property in a way that he did not, did not choose to or did not want to and, and, and you, can, you can paint him with a broad brush or, or a, a black tar brush saying that he's despicable because he's discriminating. Well, human beings are discriminating. That's part of what makes us human, and I think that's a good thing. And uh, we ought, I think we ought not to forget that we ought to allow people to be discriminating. And I think all forms of private discrimination ought to be allowed uh, by, by law, and they can be dealt with by shunning and things like that. And, but I think that we muddy the waters in the free speech area by mixing in property rights issues that, that, um, th that, that is a, a conflating right. and a mix-up that I think makes yeah. it more difficult. It's a really interesting point. Do keep in mind, though, that uh, this is a case that's being brought on those arguments. So, so that's, that, that's why the, it, it, you know, it'll be very interesting to, to, to see those rulings. On your other point, I, I love that idea. D don't don't show up. Interestingly, you know there were several efforts to repeat Charlottesville uh, uh, protests that that sort of petered out. Now I don't know what to make of that, uh, but it it was sort of like that was a combustion where a lot of things came together. Uh, of course, both sides uh, merged, and um, the police were not prepared for it, so it was handled poorly in lots of different ways. That's why I like the Skokie example where just by saying clearly, you know, we, we think you have the right to do it, but no, no one's going to be there would make a, a lot of difference. Maybe we just take one or two more. What do you, what, how, what do you, uh, yeah, great. Okay. And, and then, and then here. Yeah. Uh, I take issue with your basic premise that the founders expected these uh, rights to be absolute. I think the preamble, first thing said, informs all else all have to do with ultimate ends. The rights are necessary means, but they are not ends in themselves. Not the First Amendment, not any of the amendments. Mm -hmm. And I think that would transform the world. You know, if we just how, how, say more, how would it transform, t say a little more. If we just paid attention to the, first, uh, to the preamble and those seven ultimate ends therein stated, yeah. which all have to do with the collective, and the, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, there's the people's right yeah. That are mentioned many times. There's no individual right mentioned in the Declaration. Those, those life, liberty, and pursuit <laughs> of happiness, the very next phrase uh, or the next sentence or so, uh, mentions the uh, right of the people to, al to alter yeah. and abolish their government and form new governments. Right. And that's, that's these basic things about misconstruing rights, I think, are the root of all of our misconceptions of it. Yeah. The, uh, and I would have to, you know, yeah, I, I like I like what you're saying. I, I think when we we say absolutism here, I mean that you can't fudge on the question of we're not going to have a law that 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 limits. That's 
that's an example. And when you start to say uh, some f speech is allowed, others not, it gets uh, into a subjective area that makes it very difficult to uh, to decide, well, this is legal or it's not legal. So, yeah, I, I think what you're making a good point. Was there? Yeah. I liked um, uh, the comment that Pete made about what if someone had a rally and nobody showed up to protest against it. And it just made me think of the media. Um, I'm very pro-media. I think the media is doing some great things. On the other hand, when you look at some of the films of you know, these protests, the media is right there. And obviously, um, bad news sells newspapers, OK? So there's a benefit to being in on the news and um, you know, taking the most far out news and blasting it across the country because that gets people's attention yeah. you know, in a bad way, not necessarily a good way. And, and I don't, as I said, I don't mean to be negative about the media. I know it's a difficult position to be in, but I can't help but think you, you have all these cameramen lined up and these skinheads are marching and that's going to egg them on as much as regular people protesting. Sure. So, so if uh, I may ask you, what, what would the solution be? Uh, and you, you know, ignore, you know, you can ignore some things, but, you, you know, if you say, well, we're not going to cover Charlottesville uh, b because who, who knows where it may lead, that's just, it's an untenable position. You right. know, it, it's something that's happening, it's important. I think we're better off. It has to be accurate, and, and, and sometimes you'll see a demonstration and you, you see the, the picture that looks like it's full and it's not, or vice versa. It's got to be accurate, and it has to be fair, uh, and, and there's a whole world we could talk about for another app. Let's do that. Let's talk about it now. Uh, but I think the question is, you know, we, we, we want to provide that information and, and you decide. And um, in, in the case of Charlottesville, Looking back on it, despite the tragedy that occurred there, it was a very cathartic event. And a lot of important discussions occurred around that that probably helped to diffuse future demonstrations along those lines. So, uh, you know, we have a long way to go on, on that front. But, um, yeah, I mean, maybe you jump on the same question. Yeah, yeah. Well. My question is, I've often heard that good news doesn't sell. And I just really want to know if that's the truth or whether there, you know, I, I often think, particularly, we often see it in church, the good news stories about sure. the heroic things that happen and how when hard things happen, there are just people out there doing really good things. But yeah. you don't see that on the news. You see it in church, and I'm just wondering yeah. whether it really is true that good news doesn't sell. Well, it, it's nothing is ever going to be as simple as those kinds of slogans. Good stories, maybe a, a positive outcome, do sell if they're done well. When you say good news doesn't sell, usually that's because we trumped up something to make it sound good. You know, there, there, there have been publications that said, I'm going, only going to report good news, and they do not succeed. Because that's not real life. Uh, you, you know, we've we've had a period of a lot of negative and disturbing news. Um, the truth of the matter in the media, you're not really selling the, the news. It, you, most of it's subscription. You've already made the decision you're going to get this, uh, and so you don't have to uh, overplay stories. You want to get it right. Now, sometimes you will encounter uh, stories that have been handled poorly. I think a balance of positive. And, and, and difficult news is what people look for. Let's tell the stories behind the news. Um, and many of those are very positive. You know, actually, when you look through paper or websites, you'll find lots of positive news. Sometimes your eyes just go to the, the, the negative one because that's the, the nature uh, that, that we, we, we are. Uh, but no, a good, deep, you know, uh, complex, positive stories are very powerful. Maybe we should, uh, okay, one more, yeah. It's, 
Well, I mean, you know, when, when something is startling, you're going to want to know about it. Certainly, trouble is, is an important part of, of, of the news business. But what I'm saying is, if you look at the whole array of what most respectable news organizations are providing, it's all kinds of things, positive and negative. And that's what you really want, a full portrait of what's going on, whether it's a community, local community, the nation, or, or, or the world. I think I should wind things up now, if, if that's uh, if if that seems right. I want to just show you, share with you, in 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 that conclusion, some comments I, I mentioned um, that I've been studying this. I, I love comments. You've all heard this before from Jefferson saying, "If it were up to me," but you don't often see that second part. It would also be every person. I love the fact that he's talking about newspapers here. See. Uh, you should be required to, to, to read them. But the point here is an important one, that you really have to have have that information, just like what, what we're talking about here. Um, Chris Dodd, the former senator, now head of the entertainment group, you know, it, it, the importance of free speech and, and, and the right to know sort of sit at the top of what, what a democracy needs. Um, have you heard this one before, probably? I'll de defend your right to say it. Here's a nice version of that. <laughs> I love that. And Salman Rushdie, who really began the collision, through no fault of his own, of East and West, with um, his novel that was the subject of fatwa, and uh, went through, you know, terribly difficult times, the importance of free speech. Let's leave it at uh, his, his comments. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to conclude? That? No, I just, wanted, I just wanted to say that it's a sign of a brilliant speech or a talk when you have to cut off questions. And I think we're all leaving with really important questions. So thank you for that remarkable talk. Thank you very much. Good to see everyone. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah.